Hello everyone, welcome back to the Only Networking Show, news, education and member spotlights from Only Networking. I'm James West. And I'm Kearney Frampton and we're only the network for people who like people. Fantastic. So the astute of you would have noticed that Kearney is Kearney and not Kelly. Back to upstage your mum. I am. Most popular episode ever was the one that you were on. What can I say? There you go. Unlucky <laughs> Kelly. You're no longer needed. Um, we've got lots to get through today and we've got a very special guest. We are very pleased to welcome Nisha Hack. Hello. <laughs> Iggy and Lime, we're going to find out about your extraordinary Thank name. You. Look at the dress. I know. <laughs> Look at the difference. Look. I know. Converse and I, what can I say? There we go. <laughs> So, what have we got to talk about today? Um, we've been talking about websites this month, why we don't value them enough, particularly versus social media. Um, so we're going to touch on that. We're going to talk about the impact of networking on mental health. Mm. Not spoken about enough. We've had a little chat about that beforehand. Um, we've also got Kelly's networking gem, which is Kearney's networking gem. So again, it will make it be better, won't it? Um, <laughs> I've really got to stop this. Yeah. She can't do anything about it, bless her. Um, and we are going to interview Nisha. So we're going to find out more about your extraordinary journey. Brilliant. You're going to love Nisha. <laughs> She's brilliant. So um, let's talk about mental health. So I posted on LinkedIn a while back, and I'll probably put in the show notes if you want to read this post. Um, what does networking mean to you in a word? And I was really pleased the fact that, because you'd think cynically that people are going to go, it's about getting business. And yes, it is. Of course it is. But I think there is a change in the way people perceive it now. So some of the words that got thrown back at were um, connection, camarad camaraderie, support. Good words. Um, friendship, community as a kind of one word answer. Paul invented a word. Paul Hill, love you. Um, belongingness. <laughs> quite hard to That's say, but one. quite apt. Um I was just really pleased to read that because if you don't know my story, I don't think I've shared it on the show, but I used to go networking because I was really depressed. I didn't go because I was depressed, but I learned afterwards that the reason I loved going to networking was that I felt at home mm. because, and this is what I've learned subsequently, and I will shout out to Johan Hari's Lost Connections book mm -hmm. if you want to learn more about oh, yeah, this. Yeah. Um, meaningful connections. It is one of the most fundamental parts of having a good mental health. <laughs> Um, people that are happy generally have got meaningful connection. Networking provided that to me. I felt at home. I felt comfortable. Um, so that's why the culture of only is very much about putting the relationship before what you do as a job. Because mm. mm. that's how we then, you know, let people feel comfortable to build those meaningful connections as opposed to having an agenda to get referrals, etc. Yeah. Um, so thank you, everyone that commented on that. What's your either of you who wants to go first any thoughts <laughs> on mental health yeah you've yeah i'll chip in uh, just because i love that word from paul hill belongingness it's just i think that completely sums it up and for me as a young person in business you leave college uni wherever your your journey has has got you to and you you step into business and friendships change mm. your relationships with people change and yeah. you as a person change and finding your tribe your community where you do feel part of something and you feel valued and you feel listened to is really important and that yeah. is good for mental health so i think that sums it up for me belongingness so well done paul especially for you not going into a traditional workplace like and i think that's yeah. quite a generational shift that younger people are setting up businesses yeah which is brilliant mm. but you then perhaps lack the connection which is the, yeah. the missing layer isn't yeah it? and the the imposter syndrome i think we spoke about that before but yeah to feel valued and like I say, part of something and you are, yeah, you belong is perfect. It's great. It's fundamental. Yeah. Well, yeah, I was gonna say that it's fundamental to human nature, isn't it? Just to feel that you belong somewhere. It's interesting you seeing as a young person coming into that. Like, I worked um, kind of in corporate, I suppose, for a good few years before starting up my business. So I was 21 when I started and then 23 when I went full time. And that kind of transition, like, oh, I'm a one woman band kind of thing. Like, I don't have any colleagues and you feel really alone because you don't have that support. You don't go on a commute and go to work and, oh, how's so-and-so in the office? You don't have those little interactions. Mm -hmm. And it's those little things that you really need, those day-to-day -day human kind of interactions with people. And that's kind of where only has been so wonderful and like having those connections I, th I for me that's what networking means for me connections and like you said it's not about getting those business referrals and stuff yeah obviously that's a byproduct of it but it's mm. just people 
connecting and making those stories together memories and that feel good kind of vibe because there's no people don't go into making their own business for just purely the money because you, you're just not going to be able to sustain it you go into it because you're passionate about it and you love what you do and you want to share that passion with other people who love what they do and then how you can help with that and that is just not actually going to help your mental health isn't it it's I mean, such a feel, good point i you know i was a journalist i became a freelance writer I could do that fairly efficiently at home. I could build websites and stuff, but I was miserable because just making money for money's sake when you're then on your own day in, day out, that's a slog for any person, isn't yeah. it? So unless you do and go and work in a shared workspace or somewhere like that, which we can't all do, online networking kind of plugs that gap, doesn't it? Yeah, and also when you're first starting out as well, Sometimes you don't, like you said, mention about imposter syndrome. You kind of think, am I doing this right? Am I all by myself? Or actually, oh, I'm going through this similar issue. Or how do I do tax? Or how do I make a brand? Or how do I, you know, all these other things that, you know, you have to figure out all these things yourself, especially when you're starting out by yourself. You have to wear so many hats. So it's nice to have that kind of network and that support where you can bounce off from other like, other people. And like you said, you've got such a diverse group of people in only with all different types of skills and expertise. And that's naturally just going to help you with your confidence, isn't it? And that's all part of building up good mental health. Isn't it? I think so. And, you know, I think the thing that there's lots to be proud of with what we've done at only, but I think the one thing that leaps out that is a real goosebumps moment where you think this is important is the people that have said only got me through lockdown. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it gave me, you know, people said in the early days and we were doing lives and we were bringing everyone together, we did only bunker, didn't we? Yeah. <laughs> where we yeah. just did a Zoom call and said, let's all come in and we're all in the same boat and sharing. That feels like it's worthwhile, doesn't oh, it? How yeah. was lockdown for you? <laughs> it was a coaster. It was it was it had huge highs, yes. but then I had huge lows. Yeah. Um the highs being I'm, I launched Iggy and Lime in the second lockdown. That was unplanned to do it in a lockdown. I was like no time better than just doing it. So uh, that was in November 2020. Um, I was originally going to launch it in March 2020, funny enough. Um, I was like, oh, okay, pandemic's happening. Maybe now is the best time to launch a new business. Um, so that was some of the highs. And it's been an amazing journey to kind of like even just being here with you guys now and better to talk about it. But then obviously the lows, I, I got asthma and I was shielding, uh, voluntary shielding and having that independence taken away from me severely impacted my mental health because I'm a very independent person and having to rely on other people just to do basic things like grocery shopping and yeah. stuff like that. Um, and be, being a photographer, I'm such a people person. Obviously my industry was severely impacted. Um, so just trying to juggle all those things. But don't get me wrong, I really enjoyed the online connections and being able to still have that kind of support, even if you can't meet people in person. And then when you did get to meet when the lockdowns eased, it felt so much better. It felt so good having that first hug. And I felt like, oh, good you yeah. know having that and like when you did some of the events last summer uh, i was like oh yeah this is amazing you mm -hmm. felt felt really good and you feel really alive again mm -hmm. so yeah it was definitely a, a bit of both but i feel so much stronger for that journey yeah and i'm glad i've gone through that it's definitely taught me if i can get my business and feel stronger at the end of it um and launch a second one in a pandemic you kind of feel like oh yeah i can do anything i could mm. i could be okay sure, and, isn't it? and loads of other people that when going for the pandemic and just thinking god if i can survive this yeah your resilience and how you view yourself it's just it's shot up so much so yeah. um yeah it's kind of fun. and also that reframing of the in-person stuff you know because yeah. we've not gone back to facilitate that but I think it's flipped around, isn't it? That the online world can give you most of what you need, but the in-person bit, rather than leading with it and all the time of doing mm. that every week and mm. having one-to-ones in person, which is now, I don't know how we find the time yeah. to do it, yeah. but you can go and have those get-togethers informally, mm. formally, and just enjoy it but yeah. without thinking, oh, I've got to get a result out of this bit. You can just make it the fun part, can't you? Or, a, or an extension of that. So, excellent. Mm. Well, thank you. Thank you both for sharing. We've got to talk about websites now. It feels like superfluous, doesn't it? But <laughs> we did do education on websites. Cla uh, Claudia Tinarello um, gave a great education. So we've been talking about it this month. And I think the thing that stood out for me was this idea that, um, well, we talked about copy being overlooked, the wording on websites 
people getting knotted up over platforms. And these days, most of the platforms, WordPress, Wix, Squarespace, code it yourself. They can all give you a result, but they can all fail. There isn't any like absolute method that's going to guarantee a result. So Helen Beckenham, one of our members, is a copywriting specialist. And she said, in terms of copy, I like this expression, make your website immensely readable. Mm. That's a nice little turn of phrase, isn't it? <laughs> um, do people want to read it? Is it easy to read? And the most magnetic word, according to Helen, that we read on a website is your. Because mm. it forces you to think for something from your perspective. And we talked about the fact that too many websites keep saying I. Yeah. I have, I can, I've done. It's very self-centric, isn't it? Rather mm. than what you can give, isn't it? It mm. might validate what you do, but that's your story as the business owner, not mine. We're going to talk about personal branding a little bit. Well, mm -hmm. not later, because that's only talks, isn't it? A um, <laughs> couple of other people to mention. Um, one corner, and this is the bit about not giving a website enough credibility or credence um it's the one corner of the internet that you've got absolute control over mm. that that is not the case on social media we put so much weight on social media we can't tell who's looking at mm. it who's going to be shown that piece of content um sasubi was the one that actually talked about that corner of the internet but then alan braithwaite said it's the centre of your digital ecosystem. Mm, that's good, yeah. Because it's your hub, isn't it? It's the mm. bit that everything else should spin out from. Um, and this point that even a neglected website will get 50, maybe 100 visits a month. Wow. If you look at any statistics of websites. But if you think about that, if you're then not bothered about what's on your website or you never change it, you're basically saying to the 50 or 100 people that are there to look at your website, don't really care. Yeah. yeah. What you're seeing. Mm. Uh, imagine that in a room of 50 people stood in front of you going, all right, tell me about yourself. I'll yeah. read that thing that I wrote two years ago. Yeah. Whereas we spend all this time stressing about social media and not. Your website's interesting because I this literally happened. I Someone said, do you know a photographer? And I shared a couple of the photography contacts that we've got. And they immediately went, I want to work with Nisha because Aww. of our website. <laughs> that, that's the power of it isn't it a yeah. good website is the bit where people you probably don't even know that because they wouldn't have contacted you and said because of your website no that's interesting and uh, feedback actually that means a lot because i designed my website from scratch myself so uh, it's nice to know that it's given that impression so, mm. and i'll tell you who that was after the show I won't <laughs> say it, live, I it is a first them. impression though isn't it that is your your first impression on someone so that, it is important and well, it's all about branding, yeah, yeah. People don't realise that if particularly if you're buying B2B services, everyone validates you by looking at your website. Mm. You don't buy a service unless you check someone's website. Unless oh, yeah. it's unless it's a tenner. <laughs> but you don't, do you? you yeah. You're always gonna check the website. But because people don't necessarily tell you that they've read the website, you think it isn't performing a purpose. Yeah, it's important to actively ask for feedback. Yeah. And not be worried about it because you can you can give that back to someone and that that changing i to your is something small that you can change and it will really make a difference so constantly keeping up and and checking that it's relevant is is a good thing to do Absolutely. good practice so don't spend so much time on social media give some love to your website mm -hmm. <laughs> very important fantastic that's enough on websites <laughs> i think we made our point um it's that time again isn't it it's kelly stroke kearney it's kearney's Kearney's networking <laughs> gem role credit animation thing. Fire away. So, my Kearney's networking gem. So, as a title, paying attention pays off. So, this kind of relates to last month's um, Kelly's networking gem, which was how to have a one to one. And I'm, I'm kind of taking that on. But I think it relates across the board. So, whether you're having a meeting, whether you're having a one to one, email, any interaction that you have with a person you have to pay attention. And recently I've been having a lot of one-to-ones with members and visitors alike across the globe. And it's only recently that I've noticed that I'm having conversations with people in America, people in Greece, people literally globally. Mm. And you have to pay attention because cultures and, and these people in different places communicate differently. Mm. So you can't assume that you're gonna in interact in the same way. So that's one thing I took away. Um, be present listen, engage. It's very obvious stuff, but 
I think reflecting on the way I have a one-to-one -one now to how I was before is that I was worried about my body language, their body language. I was worried about topics, thinking about the conversation flowing. I was worried about it stopping, not knowing what to say. And thinking about all these things, I wasn't actually listening to what the person was saying. So the conversation would be very stale, very this, that, the other, not really much point to it. So I think if you can limit your distractions, so turn your notifications off, make sure your environment is set that you can really be present in that moment, have a set list of prompts so that you don't have to be worried about what you're getting from the conversation and you, you, you're keeping on the right track. And again, it's very obvious, have resources around so that you can take notes pen and paper. You don't want to have to be using all of your brain power, remembering things as the person saying, just have a pen and paper at the ready um, to take that, that pressure off. And don't let a conversation be the end of a relationship. And I think yes. we do talk about networking guess who quite a lot, don't we? And I think you can't judge someone based off one conversation. Yeah. It takes a lot to build a relationship with someone. So don't be too quick to judge, make the connections and the introductions that you promised that person check in with them regularly, yeah. you know, get to know them um, and refer to topics that you previously discussed. So that goes back to the note taking. Talk about their kids if they talked about their kids. Yeah. Talk about their hobbies if they mentioned it, you know, engage and and show that you are being engaged and, and reacting to what interests them because it paying attention, you will get attention in return. Um, and the most important part is if you don't pay attention, you're wasting your time and you're wasting the other person's time. Yeah. So, you know, you're dedicating that, that time to the person. So be present. You know, if you can't give someone an hour, give them 45 minutes and use that extra 15 minutes to wrap up. But you can be present for that 45 minutes. Yeah. So, yeah. I love that. Thank yeah, you. Because really one to ones, if you're not careful, can become a bit of a I tick the box. Yeah. Mm rather than got anything of value from it. And um, we've talked quite a lot on the show, haven't we, about this realisation that online networking is incredible for volume of connections, mm. but it's not so good for depth or uh, um, the immediacy of the depth that it builds into relationships, of course, isn't yeah. as good because when we met in person, we'd be getting coffee or we'd be walking from the car and you'd get those little filler mm. conversations. Have you found this? Is it harder to build depth into relationships online? Yeah, it's interesting you said that, especially the start of lockdown where it was kind of like whoosh, Zoom overload mm. and yeah. don't get me wrong, it was very exciting. But then after a couple of months, you're like, oh, this is a lot of Zoom calls and mm. a lot of one-to-ones and then you start to realize even though people weren't really going out much it, you're well they called it zoom fatigue didn't they yeah. and um you just kind of get a little bit like oh i'm back to about one-to-ones and you kind of your brain just gets a bit fuzzy and stuff and yes. I, me as personally i love be seeing people in person and like their body language and how we communicate is so much more than just what we say it's a mm. whole aura isn't it so being able to not being able to have that when if you, everything's online, um, it can let you to can feel like a bit of a, a tick box. And when you want to, especially if it's people relationships or building those connections, you want to get into the deep stuff. Like, I don't know about you, but sometimes such a small talk can be a bit like, oh. yeah. <laughs> so, so she just want to go, like, I want to get into the juices. Oh, you know, really want to know what makes you tick or really want to know what makes you passionate and get those, like you said, this deep mm. conversations. And that's where all the juicy stuff comes from. And that's when you get excited about working with someone or wanting to collaborate with them. Mm. Um, and sometimes you do miss that if you're like, oh, I've booked in 10 one-to-ones today. I've only got 20 minutes with you. Yeah. You've already kind of denying that other person who might want to really get to know you uh, because you you packed your schedule too tight. So it could just be worthwhile maybe having 10 one day, maybe just cut it down to three or four or something or even less than that. Yeah, and just having would, those deep a conversations. A couple of day, I would say, yeah. is probably the limit oh, to yeah. get anything valuable yeah, from yeah. it. And it's interesting what you say about the depth because I think there's a growing sort of divide between people because we've had other people, and Kelly says this, mm. um, I she finds it easier and a lot of people do to actually build depth online because there's less distraction around you mm, like I background do. noise you've said this I'm feeling this now because what we found when we do anything in person particularly last year you said the word small talk you have the same conversation over and over <laughs> oh you're taller than I thought you were going to be <laughs> oh when was it have we actually met in person and you end up doing yeah. the same bit and it's exhausting yeah <laughs> So, again, I think if you can reframe 
if you just treat anything at kind of a surface level of oh i'm just here to tick a box and have a little chat with you yeah you do but you it's like in person you cannot build depth because you can just as we found, you know, your mates come and sit next to you. Or when you go to an in-person event, you tend to congregate around the people that you already know. Yeah, yeah. So mm. I think that it really comes down to both can work to build depth, mm. but you've got to put the effort in to get that depth into it. I but... think there's also an element of openness. As long as, like, I think one of the biggest things I learned over lockdown is it's okay to be vulnerable. And I think yeah. it kind of goes back to what you mentioned about mental health. When you show elements of vulnerability in you and you're opening yourself up a little bit, people, especially if empathetic people, are going to respond to that really well. So yeah. when you kind of open that up and like, oh, they, they shared something quite personal about themselves to me, mm. I feel really kind of honoured that you would do that. So you could, the other person is going to naturally feel like, oh, I, I want to open up to you and respond that way. And that's kind of where you get to the depth. Yes. Whereas small talk, you don't share any vulnerabilities because right. it's just what's on the shadow, what's on the surface. So I think there's elements of like, even whether that's in person or online, you can get into those deep conversations if each person of that conversation is willing to be open with it. Love that. Because that, again, an online networking event or an in-person networking event, generally we're trying to show our best side, aren't we? Yeah, yeah, you totally. Know, we're kind of on stage and we want to make sure people see the best of us. So you don't tend to reveal that side of yourself, do you? But it is the one-to-one. -one, so whether you do that in person or online. Fantastic. Thank networking you. gem. Kearney's networking gem. Thank you very much, Kearney. Okay, so this is the best bit, isn't it? The interview. So I've got a little bio that I've written <laughs> about you. I haven't read it back, so it might be wrong, but here we go. <laughs> Nisha Hack, Iggy Lime. Nisha Hack is the award, multi award winning photographer behind the brand Iggy and Lime. With a background in graphic design and marketing, Nisha helps her clients bring out their authentic personal brand, which is why she has been described as a visual brand specialist. That bit's important. She's also one of the nicest people we've met on our networking journey, and her personality is one of the reasons she makes her subjects feel so comfortable. Nisha, welcome to the show. Thank you. Oh, I'm so, I'm so happy to be here. Thank you for having me on. We should get Rob to do, like, poppers or poppers? <laughs> Balloons flying. <laughs> Confetti. Confetti. I thought poppers is something entirely different. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe edit around that one. So <laughs> let's talk a bit because wedding for you do do wedding photography, you do corporate photography, for want of a better word, for Iggy and Lime, don't you? But let's go back to the beginning. Why photography? Where did that love come from? Yeah, photography has always been part of me since I was a child. I think photography for me, it brings people together. It's the most joyous thing I think in my personal life. And I want to share that with other people. I think I remember a childhood memories for me is when my dad would get everyone together um, for family photo. And like, oh, you know, we're in Cornwall or we're in whatever. And like, oh, come on, everyone get together for the family photo. And I was like, oh, me being the extrovert that I am, I was like, oh, yeah, and I'd be really smiley for the photo. Um, and for me, that was kind of what I remembered about the holiday. I couldn't, I remember other bits, obviously, in my childhood, but it's those photographs and I look back at those photographs and I remember oh I had a really good childhood or oh, those memories and those holidays or those elements or just even at home day-to-day -day life those are the moments that really stood with me and I, I feel like that's kind of what photography is all about is building those memories and building those experiences and that's what I want to give to the people that I work with is to have an amazing experience with me feel that joy celebrate something about themselves whether that's a wedding day whether that's a business launch whether that's just like Oh, I've got a brand new haircut. I want to show it off. Celebrate yourself. That's kind of my ethos with photography, and that's why I'm so passionate about it. Why I love doing it because it's it's always been part of my journey. I just didn't know it back then, um, but yeah, growing up that's now, lovely. I kind of realised that's kind of what photography means for me. And it comes across. I mean, I'd, I'd urge you all to look at Nisha's website, mm -hmm. look at her photography, because the word that I would use to describe it, there's a joy in your photography. Because mm -hmm. a lot of corporate photography. It can look, as you would imagine, quite professional, quite staid. All of your shots have got that joy in them. Oh, thank you. I'm really glad that you picked up on that because that's one of my core brand values is, is joy, whether that's 
during the experience and you're having a good time and it's really fun um, and in terms of how the picture comes across and for people to feel that joy when they see those photographs I think at the end of the day you can still be I know serious or professional as you want um, but it still has to have that element of something joyous I think at the end of the day because it's why do we do what we do if it doesn't bring joy <laughs> it's a good reminder isn't it that if you're not enjoying yourself if it's a slog all of the yeah. time we should remember that excitement that we felt when we started a business or definitely. where we're trying yeah, to get to. Yeah, and that to. could definitely be incorporated into kind of more the professional world and stuff where I think gone are the days where you see the stock images and it's like business person and they're in a briefcase <laughs> with this pinstripe suit and it's very stale and clinical mm -hmm. and like, yeah, business person. And you can like, oh, okay, that's not yeah. how business is. And obviously only it's a lovely reflection of that. It's all about people and personalities and stuff. Um, and that's kind of what I want to bring out when I do business photography is to showcase that personality, who they are. Their That's kind funny. Of, yeah. I can remember people would used to say, oh, I'll connect with you on LinkedIn, but don't look at my Facebook. <laughs> because I'm a completely different person. It's and I think yeah, that's gone now, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. That we're more comfortable in the way we dress, the way we kind of approach the fact that, no, we're human beings, mm. you know. Why do we have to have two personas? I think that that divide between work and life is definitely, but since lockdown also, because mm. we've had an insight to people's homes. Like, yeah. you know, you try and tidy your backdrop as like make it look really nice, but then well, the other you went even further. You built an amazing bookshelf, <laughs> that, like curves round. It's I'm, I'm well jealous of it. Yeah, home Lovely, library. It? Yeah, it is. But we could, we've got more of an insight to people's lives yeah. now, where you, what you put on LinkedIn before was like you know the most professional version of yourself, and your Facebook is when you went out for the weekend and had a few drinks. Yeah. Whereas now it's like oh. Oh, I've already seen that anyway, so you don't need to hide that from me. And we shouldn't be hiding that anyway. It makes more makes people more interesting and their stories and stuff when we got a full picture of what they're like. Don't get me wrong, it's good to have personas. Like, weekend niche show is different from weekday niche show, but not hugely different, but mm. it's still that kind of... It's nice to know that you could still share more elements of yourself because that's what people are going to be drawn to yeah. is when they get a sense of who you are and when they can trust you because... If, especially in photography, it's a very vulnerable space to be, to be in front of the camera and to allow someone to photograph you. It's quite intimate in some ways. And I want people to feel like they can trust me with taking good care of them during that experience and feel like they can feel comfortable in front of the camera. Yeah. Um, especially a lot of times, most people I've worked with, they've never been professionally photographed. So it's kind of building all that trust at the very early stages until when we get to do that photo shoot, they feel like, oh yeah, I've, I'm in good hands, I feel yeah. good. And they want to know that you can deliver that for them and they, you can offer that and having other elements of who you are in your life and those values that you share. So like, it's funny you mentioned about the books and the bookshelves and that. I love sharing other elements of my, it's got, it hasn't really got a huge amount to do with photography, but it's nice to know yeah, that yeah. like, actually you're interested in books or literature or interior design or other things like that. I was like, oh, we've got something we could talk about. Yeah. And it's not gonna just be a boring photo shoot. We've got things that we could chat, giggle about during the shoot and that can help you come out your shell and you can mm. feel like, oh yeah, this is a good experience. And okay. that's kind of where I get that crack in photo. Mm. Brand, because this is what Only Talks is going to be about before this show goes out. But um, tell us about Iggy and Lime. And if you are listening, and I'm looking at the camera saying while well, you're listening, so you won't see <laughs> yeah. me doing that. But if you're listening, Nisha is the living embodiment of her brand with her colours today. So tell us about Iggy and Lime, because it's connected with what you wear. Where did that brand come from? And why did you go so bold? Yeah, yeah. So it kind of definitely ties into... A brand for me is how it makes people feel. So especially a personal brand is very kind of tied to your personality or who you are. So when I wanted to create Iggy and Lime, it was a really exciting opportunity to create something new. So just kind of given a context, I've already been running my business niche hack photography, which is weddings and stuff for a good five, six years before I launched Iggy and Lime. Uh, and that was more organic and obviously it's my name plus photography. So yeah. it wasn't hugely inventive in that sense. With Iggy and Lime, I wanted to create a, a name where I can invite other people into it and feel like it could be more than me. I want people to feel like oh, they're part of a team as such. So I was really thinking about what that feeling would be like. Um, and we at that time we were thinking about getting a dog. And that means Iggy is shortened for Italian Greyhound. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you can see, but on my shirt, I was like, oh, so when I got the shirt, I was like, oh, this is, this is my band all over. The, pretty much what this dog is, <laughs> so what Italian Greyhound looks like. It's kind of like a whippet, but a bit smaller. Um, and 
I love how much joy Italian Greyhounds give to me. And also kind of, I'm a dog lover. I wanted to kind of showcase that element to it. And also they're really fast. So it's just really fun dogs. And the personality of an Iggy, if you ever get to meet uh, Italian Greyhounds, you'll get a sense of, oh, okay, Nisha's a little bit like that. Um, <laughs> so it's kind of, that's kind of where Iggy came from. And I was thinking Iggy by itself wasn't strong enough. It needed to have something to balance that. So I was thinking Iggy and something, okay, I need to think of something. And then I was thinking, okay, color. I think I feel I'm such a colorful, vibrant person. And I was thinking about different colors. And then when I came across lime, I was thinking, actually, lime is more than just a color. It's a sensation. It's a smell. It's a food. Um, it's kind of a color, obviously. It's, it's lots of elements. It's very versatile. And what I am as a business and as a person, I am very versatile, lots of different elements to it. Um, and I love the fact that it felt really fresh. Mm. I'm very drawn to the seasons. Mm. So spring is just, oh, this is my season when you get all the, the green kind of like um, plants kind of coming through for the soil, that renewed, refreshed feeling after winter. That's what I want people to feel like when they get to work with me is like refreshing their business, how that renewed feeling. Um, and that's kind of where that color really ties in into why I went with the lime. So that's kind of how Iggy Lime came about. Right. That's kind of the brand story to take it on. And it's, it's that two second, that's Nisha. And that's a good brand, isn't it? When you look at it and go, as soon as you launched it, when she's cracked it, because you <laughs> see it, it either works or it doesn't, yeah. doesn't it? But we're going to talk about that more yeah, in only talk. So I want to ask you about, because you were very young when you started in business. You've won awards. Was it a help or a hindrance, do you think, being young when you started in business? A bit of both. I did experience a lot of ageism when I first started out. And it's definitely been a lot, I'd like to think it's come a long way since then. But um, yeah, I did. I think also just the kind of person that I am. I think there's certain rooms that I went into where the, just to put it out there, was loads of, middle class white people all in suits we were a lot taller you can than say me. white middle aged <laughs> men if you want because <laughs> yeah, i'm very is. aware of the fact that that's what i am well it was pretty much and i'd go into a room and it literally all wore like navy black suits and there's me turning up in a bright colorful red yellow dress or whatever um and i'm only 4 11 as well so that's just st stood out like a sort um and it was really intimidating coming yeah. to that space and then I'll, i'm very bubbly i love talking to people i'm trying think of something we can have in common, but from the offset, I couldn't see a huge amount common, mm. but I tried my best. Um, and I just kind of felt like they just didn't respect me. They just didn't kind of think, oh, you're not worthy to be in this space. And it's not like things they specifically said, it was just that general attitude and that yeah. feeling. And I have had people, like when I first started my business, someone of that demographic um, said to me that my business would fail. Just point blank oh, said to no, me, your business why? will fail. I was kind of saying, I'm going to start a photography business. This is what I'm going to do. I just pretty much says as your business will fail. I was like, well, you, you don't know me personally as much. You don't know my journey. You don't know what my um, goals and motivations are. And I'm I'm incredibly driven. And the naysayers early on in my career definitely drove me to be where I am today. It's not what drives me now, but it definitely drove me to start up my business yes. and kind of. There's an element of proving people wrong. Um, there's not many people that look like me do what I do. And it was hard to see that representation. So I just had to figure that out myself. Um, so yeah, going back to your question, I think it was, did you say about being young? Help or a hindrance being young? Yeah, so the that was more the hindrance. The help was more like, I felt really refreshed. I felt new, it felt exciting. I felt like I hadn't, I don't have huge responsibilities. I know, imagine if you've got a mortgage or if you've got kids or other life responsibilities, it can be quite hard to start a business because you've got all the other things to think about. I didn't have any of that. And mm -hmm. I was like, I'm just, I'm just gonna go for it. I don't have, like the risk wasn't as scary to go full time because the worst case scenario would be, if it doesn't work out, I'll try and find another job. So that was probably more what the help was and mm. where I was in my career. This I've already saved up enough money. I, so just to give it a context, I worked a couple of years in graphic design full time, doing my wedding business in the weekends, seven days a week, sometimes working 100 hour weeks and stuff in wow. the summer, like back to back, do two weddings and then go back to work and commute. And then it got to the point where I was like, oh, yeah, I really need to figure out how I'm going to sustain this or just go full time with the business. Mm. Um, and yeah, it was just trying to, I had saved up a lot of money for my full time job. So I was able to kind of feel confident that I was able to, to do that 
So in terms of in answer to your question, then it was a bit of both. And being brave. And I think it's really important to get this point across because we've talked about mm. this, haven't we? If you're a young person in business and you come into that world where everyone seems to give the impression that they know what they're doing mm. and they're all doing it the same way, use that to your advantage. Because I can tell you now for a fact, most of them don't know what they're doing. Most of them haven't cracked it. And if you can look at that with fresh eyes and see why are they doing it that way i think i can do it differently mm -hmm. yeah. trust yourself because you're probably right it's really empowering as well yeah. when you realize that that you're not below the people in the room you struggled with this didn't yeah, you yeah i did you a thought, lot oh, did you young, feel that as I'm well young. massively oh yeah. these people are like oh they're on another planet yeah. and it feels not. like the it's a bit gated you yeah. don't feel like it's an open welcome and space i definitely feel like it's changed a lot and only has been a really great space to feel like it's welcoming but yeah don't i don't know if you've you mentioned you felt that way too as well yeah there was one person i won't name who it was but there was one person who was a member really early on and i was scared of him right i was really scared of him and he's still a member now but it's really interesting how i've changed in that journey mm. and he, he didn't do anything to scare me but he just came across so professional he was really good at what he did and and i could never imagine myself in a position where i needed his service mm. so i was a bit removed from ever being in a similar world to him if you know what i mean yeah. but um yeah realizing that was was empowering it That's was fascinating. yeah let's talk about so person of color in business in this country similar you know help or hindrance what's that like give us a perspective on how that is i think the biggest thing for me and i touched upon a little bit in the last answer was representation yes it's really hard to kind of figure out how you're going to do something if you haven't seen other people do it you mm. haven't really got a guidebook or like a plan or such that someone's really laid out for you um and that representation part is one of the for me and where I am in my career is one of the driving forces why I still do what I do and why I still want to talk about these kind of heavy topics and make it a space where people feel like I can talk about race or I can talk about class or or gender or other elements or that kind of stuff um because it, it's really daunting it could be really intimidating like you were saying like coming into that space um I remember when I first started my business um there was it wasn't a huge amount of support because they hadn't seen people like me or you know, a way they identify like me do it before. Especially in the photography industry, it's very uh, male, white dominated, yeah. um, and you kind of figure out where do I fit in with all this? Yeah. Like, how do I? And the energy is very different as well. Like, how does how people going to respond to my energy? And they're going to trust me? Are they going to get on with me? Do we have things in common? And all those kind of like imposter syndrome elements definitely kind of ate at me a bit. Um, but then I realised. It's a huge um, benefit more than anything. It's a, it's for me. It's my superpower because hmm. it makes me unique. I don't want to be like everyone else. This is why I dress head to toe in rainbow colours. <laughs> I don't want to blend into the crowd and my skin colour or what I look like. That just, if anything, only enhances my difference to people. And when you're in business, you want to be different. You don't want to be like everyone else. So kind of reframing how I saw myself and like, yeah, I, I know I stand out. You know what? I want to stand out even more. <laughs> and I'm going to wear the brightest colours I can wear so I don't blend in. Uh, and just using that to kind of help me with my journey and other, and other people who feel like they don't fit in. And I feel like I attract those types of people where they feel like everyone goes through elements of imposter syndrome. So in, in terms of like being a person of colour, one of my biggest driving forces, I suppose, is I want to connect with more people who feel that way. It doesn't have to be, you don't have to be a person of colour, but like just if you feel on the outskirts or yes. of whatever group or whatever tribe that you want to try and get into, that's the kind of stories that I really want to reflect, uh, shine a light on. Um, but there's definitely a long way to go in terms of making it a more... You can't avoid space. it, can you? If you go to any networking event, it's mostly white people. You yeah. know, I've got some stats here. Um, open organisation said that a six of the six million businesses registered in the UK are classed as minority businesses. So I think that's an improvement. But then look at this stat. Larger businesses are poorly represented. In 2019 was the most up-to-date government figures that I could get. 5.1% of the UK's small and medium enterprise employers were led by a majority of people from an ethnic minority. And you see that, don't you, when you go to most events, mm. mostly white people. And like you say, who's going to inspire? Who's going to attract people? Well, you are of that category. You are one of those people that are inspiring. But 
there is a whole issue around diversity, isn't there? And we talked before about class, disabilities. It's not just race, is it? What can we do? Have we got any ideas? I mean, it's a huge issue, isn't it? But how can we encourage greater diversity without forcing the issue? No, I think it definitely is. It's funny that we're talking about brand. It comes back to brand, to be honest. Okay. Because it's how you make people feel. So if it's, if we talk about organisation, what's the feeling of that space? Mm. So to attract more people to come into that space where that branding kind of makes it feel like, oh, yeah, it does feel really inclusive. Or it does feel like, yeah, I can actually get on with that space. I don't feel like an outsider or whatever. Or that culture makes you feel like we've got actually loads more in common than our skin colour. Because a, a lot of times... I I have had experiences of tokenism where oh you're the brown person I'm gonna pick you to represent um, this event that we're doing not because of my value of what I've done or achieved or who I am as a person but because you're the brown person in the room we want to select you and that it feels really alienating because you're getting chosen for the exact opposite reason of why you do what you do mm. um so i've been on both sides where of that kind of experience where you're getting um you feel empowered to be the person that you are and represent other people and it's been so lovely to when i've done like um talks and stuff to students at university and like at the end of the event they come up to me and say like oh you know it's amazing that you're doing what you're doing i didn't have anyone who looks like you or kind of your background you know it's really inspiring to see that and to know like the younger generation feels that way and having that feedback it's it's nice to know that people feel that way and Britain is becoming a lot more diverse. Mm -hmm. The younger generation is becoming more diverse. You want to see people who are already doing that and feel like I can do that too. I don't have to go into your stereotypical career path. Um, but at the same time, it's obviously being very careful of not ticking that diversity and inclusion yeah. box where you can get so caught up in the corporate world of like, yeah, we have five people who are a person of colour and there we, there we go, job done, problem solved, but not really getting to know that person and I get sometimes a little bit funny about statistics because I have been a statistic mm. and they don't get to know that person uh, and it's just like you said like a box ticker thing so it's, it's trying to find that balance but it, it it is more about having these conversations knowing people's stories and kind of sharing that and making people feel like they're included in the conversation because even the online stuff you know we've talked about the fact that even introverted people that pre previously didn't like networking because it generally is more comfortable if you're an extrovert online networking is bringing in people that ordinarily wouldn't go to networking people with disabilities different countries that we've mm. talked about so mm. i think we do have a good opportunity don't we but there's a lot of work to go as we can see from the numbers and just, the reality just things like this you know just mm. putting more media out there that people can see and respond to and feel like and that's just little bits here and there representing and like that's why my job as a photographer i find it's really important for me to showcase lots of different stories and lots of different backgrounds uh, and that's one of my biggest things that i really want to work more on is kind of showcasing more diverse stories in the work that i shoot because as a photographer i've got such a big um kind of responsibility i suppose nice. in making sure that i showcase not just one type of demographic but all, all types of people and feel like they can come into that space and feel like yeah i want to be represented and that just have a snowball effect down the line fantastic thank you nisha that's okay <laughs> we've loved having you on the show haven't we yeah it's been wonderful been super got some deep juicy stuff no, as well haven't we yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, we've got to go and do another recording in a minute but <laughs> let's wrap the show up so well thank you everyone thank you nisha thank you kenny thank you i looked at the wrong person at that point <laughs> and i said your name but there we go this has been the only networking show please like subscribe share and we'll see you again next month